Marvin Anderson, and I was born here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was born March 5th, 1940. The day is my birthday. I lived in, I lived in two places. Uh, my first home was at 775 Igohart. It was a duplex. And we lived on the bottom, and Mr. and Mrs. Maxwell lived on the top. Uh, I was there until 1947 when my father and my godfather and two other gentlemen got a loan from the Federal Housing Administration and they built 12 side-by-side -side units at 989 and 995 Rondo. And my father and my mother, they were the on-site managers, so we lived in one of the units there. The units were labeled A, B, C, D, E on both sides, and we lived in the D unit. So from 1947 until 1948 until 1968, I lived at 989 Rondo, Unit D. I left there when I went away to college in 1958, and those units were taken by the highway department for the construction of I-94. We were left in around 1959. I was away at college in 1958. So my mother and my father had to be out of the unit around 1959-1960. Those units remained standing, empty, for nine years. And then at the end of the ninth year, around 1970, we thought they were going to be destroyed because my father and at this time my father was the sole owner of the units he was told that those units did not deserve a higher valuation because they were not built solidly enough to deserve a higher valuation and my father insisted that the units that they built were as sturdy, as sturdy as any unit that could be built with concrete. And they fought that valuation at least four times they lost. And then the state purchased the units and my father and my mother moved to Maplewood. And about nine years later, they were still standing. The state came in and they sawed these units in twos, in threes, and in fours and moved them throughout the city of St. Paul and they're still standing to this day. I have pictures I can show you of where the units are located. The units that got a poor valuation from the state and that valuation was the reason that my People like myself were so disappointed and were so angry at the way that residents of Rondo were treated when I-94 came through. And that's been a part of my history for an awful long time until last July, July 17, 2015, when we gathered, we asked all of the people that had bad memories of Rondo to come to a reconciliation ceremony and we all took a piece of paper and we got a big pot and we burned our hatred and our disappointment and our anger to usher in a new day of Rondo so that's I carry that memory for a minute a long time but now it's no longer a memory that causes me any anger but it's a good memory that we need to teach people what can happen when they're not organized, when they're not united against uh, something like the freeway or something like an eco ecological disaster, something like Flint in Michigan. These things still happen to this day. And it's up to the citizens to be aware 
that it can happen, and it's up to us to be prepared for this sort of thing. And the story of Rondo, which I am proud to be a part of as the, one of the founders of the Rondo Celebration, is to teach that story to, to, to kids, to students, to let them know that the history of Rondo can be repeated today unless they're aware of that possibility and unless they're willing to stand up and fight and have your facts right and be vigilant and be prepared to stop government when it takes actions that are contrary to the ecosystem of a community. And that's what Rondo stands for. And Rondo had the uh, uh, I don't know if you remember the Green Line controversy. When the Green Line was originally planned, it was supposed to go from downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul in 47 minutes. That was the way it was sold. And in order to do that 47 minute trip, it had to go from Lexington Avenue to Rice Street. And if it went from Lexington to Rice Street, there would not be a stop at Hamlin, at Victoria, and at Western. And the people who would use public transportation, the elderly, the poor, the disabled, the minorities, were on those three stops that were not going to be planned. And there was a a community gathering and someone said let's not let the green line the green line will not be another rondo and that was the rallying cry and for the first time in my memory asian african american somali hispanic poor disabled lower class middle class people who depended upon public transportation formed a, 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 a coalition, a solid coalition, and three stops were added to the Green Line. And that's what Rondo stands for today. Yeah. When, when the freeway came through, we like to tell the story that the, the downtown business people hated the freeway, its present location. Rondo hated its present location because it was going to destroy. The downtown businessmen were against it. Downtown Business Council because it was going to build a Sears building. There's this huge Sears building. It was going to take away all of the business that would ordinarily go downtown during the workday. Rondo was against it. Prospect Park was against it. And there was one other community, and all of us were just like this. We had our reason, they had their reason, they had their reason, they had their reason. And what I tell students now, if they would have gone like that, instead of been separate, they would have maybe had a chance to get the northern route, which is an alternative route which would not have gone through downtown, which would not have gone through Rondo, which would not have gone through Pelham Park, and it would have gone along an abandoned railroad line. No people, no businesses, no homes, no destruction of a, of a 70 year old community, but we weren't organized. We weren't, we weren't, uh, we weren't together. And when communities are not together, when they can separate, uh, we call it sorting now. Uh, s when communities are sorted, when the blacks live there and the Mexicans live there and they live there, when they sort communities, we lose so much as a, as a nation. It's only when communities come together as a whole will it work. And that's, the, that's, the, that's why we tell the story of Rondo. 
that's why the story of Rondo is so important to us, to me and to others who are trying to tell it. And we tell the story of Rondo through this harvest so that people know what can be lost so they don't have to suffer what Rondo suffered. All the memories, all of this, the things we're doing here today, all they are is just recalling uh, a, a life that was uh, taken away from them. And it's a good feeling to, to, to see it again, but it's more as a, a warning to your community could be next. And you'll have to do what we're doing. And no community should have to do that if there are reasonable alternatives to particular action that they're, they're, they're proposing. And if communities act in concert and communities act together, you can force government to make a reasonable alternative action than one that's just going to wipe out a community or just bulldoze their way because they have to do it, what they call the path of least resistance. And so Rondo is, that's something that we believe in and that's something that we believe we have to share in any way that we can. We, we share our memories of Rondo as a warning to other people. You don't have to go through it. We, and we share the memories because it's nice to remember uh, it was, it was a community, it was, it was a great community, it was a, a warm community, and uh, we miss it. Well, I remember we had a thing in Rondo called the Halley Q. Brown Center. It was a community center. And, and, and the Halley Q. Brown Center was a daycare center, it was a young adult teen center, and it was a young adult center. And I remember going through that whole process. Uh, my sister had gone through it. My brother had gone through it. And I remember them coming home and being so excited since I was the baby in the family. And then I had a chance to live the same things, the, the acting class, the chess club, the snow day dance, playing on the midget and the peewee football teams, playing on the basketball teams going on the uh, going on the powwow they called it a powwow going on the hay rides your first date your first snow dance and your first girlfriend all came out of Halley and it was just a place where we were given uh, the, the the people who worked at Halley Q Brown they gave us all an opportunity to dream beyond Rondo. They, they, they said Rondo was a great place, but they always encouraged us to just read and to be more than what Rondo can give you because they saw limitations in Rondo. And it was there in Hallie Q. Brown through one of the instructors that I first was told uh, that I first heard a, fo a foreign language being spoken. Somebody was speaking French and I had no idea what, what the language was. And they said, you can learn that too. You can speak French. And I never even considered speaking of a foreign language before, but that just stayed with me and until I learned how to speak French. Years later, years later, but I think what, what, what Rondo gave me and what Halley Q. Brown in particular gave me was a spark. Uh, it was like an, uh, a pilot light. You could turn it on and, and go with it, or you could just stay. They gave you enough to, to live, but if you heard what they were saying through these instructors and the relationship, the closeness they had with us, they could give you a spark to go as far as you wanted to go, uh, educationally, athletically. Uh, they had home ec classes. You could learn how to just to run a home. You could learn how to cook there. They prepared you for whatever life 
you wanted to live. And that was one of the things that we don't have now in our community. And I think that's a big loss that kids don't know how to prepare themselves for life. And you can't always get it at home. And there was no way that we could have got that in Rondo, but we had a place that everybody trusted where you could, my parents could drop us off there uh, on Saturday morning and know that we they'd come back at five o'clock and we would not just be watching TV or let's, we, have, we would have been doing reading, writing the newspaper, doing something to keep us active. And that was how, that's one of my best memories of growing up in Rondo was the community center of Halle Q. Brown. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was another big influence. Big influence. Uh, St. James and me church. It's a very big influence in my life. Uh, Sunday school, uh, in the summer Bible camp, and on uh, the big meals, the, the, the community meals. There were a lot of cooks in Rondo that worked on the railroad. And so all the churches would have cooks. They would do these magnificent dinners after church on Sunday. And our cooks would just cook up these just great meals. And you go to church and you come downstairs and have your church dinner. It was just a fantastic. And the union hall was a big influence on our life. Uh, the waiters union, the porters union, they would host things for us to do. So everybody was, a lot of the organizations were always trying to improve their lot by creating a society that we, in my generation, could go beyond because they knew that railroads weren't going to last forever. They knew that. So they wanted us to prepare for that day when railroads would no longer be the source of income, which was their source of income. So we got a lot of that. Be ready for that. Be prepared for that. Get your education. That was the other big influence. Get educated because one day this is not going to be here. And I think if you talk to anybody from Rondo, my generation that came up in the 40s and the 50s, they'll tell you we were told we were pretty much prepared for what was going to happen. But we were not prepared for the freeway to take it away before it was done. That was the wild card that prevented uh, us from having a physical connection to the community. And that physical, the physicalness was really necessary because it was an integral part of Rondo, that little space that was ours. Well, just the apology alone wasn't enough. We asked, we did this in conjunction with the mayor, our reconciliation of forgiving and accepting was all done at one day. Uh, we forgave and they apologized. And the mayor did something later on that in last year that for our particular purposes, we wanted to build a commemorative plaza for Rondo. We wanted to build a permanent marker on this lot that we found. And we would not have been able to do it without the mayor recommending that we would be given a substantial sum of money. Well, we had to apply for it. The mayor said that if you win it, I'll approve it. So we had to submit applications and we had to go through three public hearings. And we went through three public hearings and our proposal to build the plaza was rated high enough so that if the mayor decided to give us any seat, it's not even the mayor's money actually, it's, it's the federal government's money, it's kind of complicated. But the mayor makes a recommendation that those funds would be used. The mayor did it, said what he would do. If you get through that process, I'll recommend that you receive funding. And he did. 
And so on Ju June 1st, 2016, we'll break ground on the Rondo Commemorative Plaza, which will be a way to bring all of the memories and commemorate it once and for all. Keep doing this. That's my comment. Uh, my comment is to, to keep Rondo, uh, to keep Rondo in mind as an example, as a symbol, a symbol that stands for a united community. That's something that really has to be, be has to come through. That it's a symbol of what happens when a community is disjointed and has been sorted. We, the word that we're using now, we have to unsort the community and blend it together because if it happens in Rondo, it can happen in Highland, just hasn't happened yet. It could happen at Mac Groveland. It could happen anywhere. And the reason that they pick on poor communities is that they know there, there is disunity there. So now we've formed some great coalitions here within the Frogtown Summit University area. And we're in the process now of trying to teach this message through kids and I hope, it's our hope that the Rondo Commemorative Plaza will be able to convey this message in a way that they can understand. That's my final thought.